All right, so it's noon here at um, on the East Coast, but not for me. I'm in Chicago, and that was a little bit of a confusion uh, point for me earlier today. But welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanawald. I'm the Senior Director for the Association for Academic Leaders here at One Schoolhouse. And with me today is my colleague who is in more of a typical spot for our webinars. Liz, you want to say hi to everybody, and then I'll do a little housekeeping before we get going. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Cates. I'm the senior director for um, for school. Sorry, I forgot uh, for <laughs> school partnerships uh, here at One Schoolhouse. And um, I am Sarah's in Chicago. I am in the Bay Area in Northern California and excited to be here with everybody. Well, thank you. So things are going to be a little bit different. I am going to start off with our typical housekeeping. And I also, one thing I want to say is with this webinar that's very unlike some other ones, um, Q&A is welcome along the way. We always invite Q&A, but if you throw something in the Q&A along the way as I'm sharing some stuff from MBOA, I'm happy to address that. And then also, this is our last webinar for a while. We will be back with you in April with our um, full sneak peek of the Association for Academic Leaders. And uh, between now and then, we're going to be doing lots of plotting and planning. So with no further ado, let me share my screen. And live from NBOA, I'm at an in-person conference. Super excited to be here. And it's been a great experience. As soon as we're done, I'm cutting out for the airport to head back home. So excited about that. On our blog, we have a piece about honoring Black identity and history at One Schoolhouse that really gives you an opportunity to take a look at um, how we are living our mission through our student programming here. And then just a reminder again, if you come next week, it'll be really, really quiet because we will be planning things for you. Watch your email and I'll be sure to post things on the list as well. Um, and then just a reminder that our 22-23 student course catalog is open and registrations are coming in. Liz, do you want to add a little bit about that while I stop sharing and uh, pull my notes up? Sure. Um, so uh, those of you who know our student program well know that we open our catalog on July 1st to ring in the, pardon me, January 1st to ring in the new year. <laughs> Um, and we know that this is the season when lots of folks are doing uh, course selection and registration. So um, we hope you'll take a look at our catalog. We hope you'll reach out to us. You're welcome to reach out to me or to Beta Eaton, who's our director of student support with any questions. Um, if you are a consortium member, we have our spring advisory council coming up tomorrow. Um, we're gonna spend some time talking about our language sequences and um, some changes and adjustments that we've made there that we think are really going to be um, important steps in meeting students' needs. We've just seen explosive growth in those language courses. And so we're looking forward to spending a little bit of time talking about them tomorrow. So I hope you'll join us. Great, thank you so much. And as I shared, I'm here at the MBOA annual conference and there are just a few themes that have really been coming through. First of all, folks are delighted to be back it together in person. And like I said, I have my mask right here. I'm far, far away from, I mean, it's, I'm in a corridor with nobody in it. So, um, but we've got our wristbands that indicate we're vaccinated. We've got little stickers on our badges that indicate our comfort level, you know, open for a hug, good for the elbow bump or you know, stay further away. People are just really respecting that. And uh, it's, it's nice to see it really working. So shout out to NBOA there. I would also be really remiss yeah, if I sorry. didn't. Yeah. Can we just pause? And um, for folks who don't know what NBOA is, could you just <laughs> explain um, the very fun and interesting group of people you've been hanging out with for a few days? Absolutely. These are the folks who power the finances of independent schools. And so they are the business officers, the controllers, the director of auxiliary programs, and HR professionals. So the, the people who make the finances work and make it possible for us to live our mission. And there's an important partnership that I was about to mention, which is that One Schoolhouse and NBOA together produce the online learning for NBO members. So come 
uh, courses such as the Art and Business of Financial Aid, Essentials of the Business Office. There are courses that go into great detail about things that a lot of us might find a little bit scary, like tax implications, but are really important for our schools. And these are the folks who make it happen. So thank you, Liz, for saying that. Um, and then also our leader, Brad Rathgever, head of school and CEO, won the Sarah Daniel Award for Innovation here at in BOA. And so yesterday I was able to attend the luncheon. I took some photographs with my little iPhone and in BOA took some really good professional photographs. So we're going to post those on our website, not the ones that I took, but it was really just a real honor to see him win that award and give his accepted speech. So it was a real pleasure. So shout out Brad, congratulations. Good. Um, really a nice rec uh, recognition of his many years of leadership in this area. Thanks. So a couple uh, of, sorry, I was going yeah, to say, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, tell us a couple of things you learned. Like, what was really interesting and exciting for you? Yeah, so some themes that have emerged here. One is really around hiring. And on two fronts, many sessions on hiring. One is on dealing with the fact that um, schools are hiring more people than ever before. Folks are, you know, in independent schools are doing some of the things that other other industries are seeing too, right? Lots of people leaving, lots of people moving on um, how to hire. And then the other is about how to create organizations that are more supportive and equitable and have a justice lens in hiring. So really rethinking hiring in terms of not looking for who has done this before somewhere similar, but who has the competencies and the capacity to make an impact here at our organization in a way that's mission aligned. And I've just really been um, impressed by the HR folks at MBOA who have led the programming and then the schools who have shared their efforts and, and how that's coming together. So um, if you have at your school someone who registered for the conference, ask them how it went. And if they attended it digitally, there were 700 people on site. And then they also had a digital registration option. So you may want to check in with someone at your uh, school who has registered that way and asked them about some of the insights they gained. Another big topic here are legal sessions. And I just left the session that I promised the listserv that I would attend and really got some great insights there. Found out that in the last five years, the Department of Justice has been increasingly interested in nonprofits. The kinds of things that are now discoverable are receipts from lunches or dinners, if the heads of school regularly have, say, a monthly dinner in a certain community. What did they talk about? If they're meeting via Zoom, were those recorded? Well, that is now discoverable if there's an antitrust lawsuit. And uh, one of the interesting case studies that just appeared was that schools that agree not to take on a family that still has a debt to another independent school, and they all agree about that together, that is an act of collusion and could potentially really expose them to harm. And uh, Deborah Wilson, who is president of SAIS, led that session and she had a lot of really um, pithy things to say. If you've ever heard Deborah present, it's a real treat and I cannot recommend that enough. And it was recorded. So if somebody at your school has a chance to see that recording, they may enjoy that. Um, some other recommendations, as I mentioned to the listserv, definitely uh, desirable not to. Um, share specific financial information in a way that looks like you're trying to cooperate with other schools and be in alignment. You don't even want a whiff of that. And uh, I'm gonna quote Deborah here. She said, it is probably cheaper to have an accident in the parking lot than it is to defend yourself against one of these suits. So that being said, <laughs> Liz, I know that was a lot. Um, I think one of the things that I think I wanna unpack a little bit here is what happened at our school. You know, there's a lot of communication and uh, folks talking with one another. How was the last, you know, two ongoing into our third academic year that has been an impact? And so people had really different experiences. Yeah. Um, so 
So give me an example of, of what you're hearing and, and, and about, what, about what some of those sort of conflicting messages or, or uh, conflicting narratives are. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the sort of conventional wisdoms is that independent schools did really well last year. And some of the popular press wrote, you know, private school enrollment soared. But Heather Hurl, who is the uh, executive director of EMA, the Enrollment Management Association, said actually overall the median enrollment in independent schools is down. Oh. So, hmm. So, you know, it's interesting. You know, in the, one of the, one of the, I don't know if you call it a cliche or a metaphor, I guess it's a little bit of both, is that, you know, the, the pandemic has been one storm with many boats. Um, so, so Sarah, part of what I hear you saying is that we need to be really careful about, about us, assuming the universality of our experience, whether that's within our school or within our city or, or within, even maybe within our sector, that um, you need to know not just the school that you're in, but you need to know the big picture. Um, what's, what's something else that was really interesting that, that's going to be a takeaway for you? So, yeah, okay. One of the things is we all know that families are thrilled to be back in school, right? We hear that. We want our kids in school. We want our kids in school. But then Heather shared another point, which was that only four out of 10 parents said they were highly satisfied with their child's independent school. Yikes, right? I mean, uh. And she had some other stats on, you know, it's become very much a year to year decision for a lot of families. And then we talked about this at our table because, you know, we did some turn and talk time and there was a real question, is this a general, life is not great right now, so no, I'm not highly satisfied with my child's independent school, but I still think that, you know, it's the best option, and it's where I want them to be, so, or, you know, people talked about, is there something else, and Liz, I think you've got some thoughts on the whole, what does it mean to do school? Yeah, so this is something that we were, we've been talking, talking about at one schoolhouse for a long time, but also really over the past couple of years, which is that Things that um, schools assumed were just simply not something they would ever do, all of a sudden, within a matter of days, were became their normal operating. Right? We we exploded what school meant. You didn't have to be within a building. You didn't have to be doing it at the same time. You didn't have to be doing it with the same people. Um, and there are all those things that we don't do that you know, suddenly became the things we were doing. Um, and, you know, it's been pretty well documented in the media that there were some pieces of that that people really liked. Um, yeah. You know, you see, con you see notes about kids who, when you remove the social dynamic from learning, really made huge boosts in their in their academic growth because there was a whole level of anxiety that wasn't there. Um, you saw families who said, you know, gosh, why don't we go stay with the grandparents for three months now? We're all working remotely. Um, and then you also saw families who, um, who said, you know what? We really like skiing from three to six every day. So <laughs> we're gonna go to our ski home and you kids can, you can zoom into school for, for until 2.30 and then at the end of the school day, let's all suit up and get out on the slopes. Um, so, well, I don't think anybody wants to go back to crisis distance learning. I feel like that's a pretty safe thing. Lots I think of you're people, safe there. <laughs> yeah, lots of people saw things in that experience that, that they'd be interested in holding on to. Yeah, and I think schools had to make decisions, and we're all making the best decisions that we can at any point in time. You know, what do we continue? What do we not continue? And then if you have a student who is home because, they, for example, they've tested positive, but they really feel fine and they're confined to their bedroom, are, are they able to zoom into school? And then where do you make those decisions? And schools made different decisions. Um, because we're not colluding with one another, but we are collaborating and sharing some best practices and ideas. And collaboration is still absolutely A-OK. -okay. So that there's a lot of nuance to there. And I would say that the dust has not settled yet. So, you know, what, I think there's, it's worth pointing out that those, 
benefits too that people saw in the in the experience were were wide. That for some students it was about get getting away from bullying. For other students and uh, particularly students of color, it was about getting away from systemic racism that was impacting the way that they that they were experiencing school and institutions. Um, so some families, it was an expression of privilege, right? That they could go away to their vacation house. Um, and, and I think that we have to be very aware about the ways, about the ways in which we, um, we make those choices and adapt them so that we are, as schools, we're making equitable choices. Um, and also that we really are thinking that we're really thinking through, we make those cho choices who they are designed to benefit. Um, and Sarah, with that information about four out of 10 parents being highly satisfied, what else are we finding out about, um, about parents? Because of course, you know, business officers know that tuition is the largest part of our operating budgets. And if we start to see those numbers change, that's going to really change what the experience on campus is like. Absolutely. And there's there's no getting away from that. And I think something that's related to what you were talking about is we have become as a culture, you mentioned this to me earlier, you know, streaming services. We want things to come to us. And that is definitely true of parents. They would like to have all of those needs met. And I think where it gets super complicated is this nuance of school is a what? Is it an experience? Is it an essential? Is it a must have? You know, where where does all of that come up together? And um, something for academic leaders who need to get their heads around this is that faculties are stressed. Resignations I'm hearing here are coming in hard and fast. Uh, sometimes people leave a session because they've got something coming up. And how do we get faculty on board with the idea that every interface that you have with a family is an opportunity for delivering on that promise and that the tiny things add up. And that's one of the things that I've learned here too, that the decision to leave a job or the decision to pull your child from a school is not usually a one big thing happen. It's, you know, the preceding incident might seem really small, but it's the last one and it's where the family says, okay, we're out or where the teacher says, you know what, I, I, I just need time and I'm gonna take it starting now. So if I, can, if I can push a little bit further on that, that idea about, um, about the role, you know, expectations for faculty over the past two years have been extraordinary. We've asked them to teach yes. in new modalities. We've asked them to adapt to new health and safety. We've asked them to you know, react to the fact that kids were accessing information in very different ways and with varying degrees of success based on, many, on things that were you know, for many months entirely outside of a teacher's control. Um, but what I hear you saying is that there's also, that there's another thing that, that schools need to ask faculty to be mindful of as well. And that's that, um, you know, I, I did enrollment management for a number of years and enrollment management officers are fond of saying that admissions is everyone's business. Um, mm -hmm. And that the corollary to that is retention. I may have come up here a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, and that retent, more importantly, retention is everyone's business. Um, but thinking about, about this, you know, business officers have a unique perspective on the school as an ecosystem. What are they seeing? About um, about what's happening about about teachers and that that for our audience of academic leaders, what are things that we can be learning from business officers about things like hiring and about things like expectations? Well, so I'm going to tell you that they're worried, and I'm going to tell you that they are looking to balance the idea that. Um, Salary expectations for our really talented faculty are, are high, 
right? Wages are going up and yet they're stressed about tuition. And so they are really counting on academic leaders to provide something that is significantly valuable to families. And what that means and what that looks like is gonna vary from school to school, right? There are schools that are um, steeped in a faith-based tradition, and that is part of their mission and part of what they're delivering. There are schools that are absolutely committed to, um, I, I hate to call anything out because then it's like, who are you leaving out? So I'm going to pick Montessori because that's a really obvious one sometimes, right? So that they are doing something that is really unique and separate from what other schools are doing. And so that is an empowering them to say, look, you're getting something different. And that's what we're providing and we're doing it really well. And so alignment to mission, reminding everybody about your alignment to mission regularly, not just checking in at the end of the year, like, hey, did you have a good year? And here's your report card, but throughout the year, showcasing opportunities to, to show that you're living your mission and that you're fulfilling that promise that you made. You know, it's interesting when you think about hiring, we said just a few minutes ago that, you know, we really exploded the idea of what school could look like, um, you know, not not because we wanted to, because we had to. Um, and we didn't just do that for our students and their families, right? We did that for our teachers. Um, and all of a sudden, the idea that, you know, if you had a child who was homesick, maybe you didn't have to call in sick for the day. Um, you know, that, that, that idea about flexibility, and again, nobody wants to go back to crisis distance learning, but what it meant to not have a commute every day or to be able to be flexible around child care or, um, or to be able to be a caretaker for somebody in your family. Um, teachers saw those possibilities too. Um, and so part of it sounds like what we need to think about is also academic leaders deciding what degree of flexibility is sustainable for their community. Um, you know, and let's be honest, there are differences from job to job. This is not the same for a, a high school English teacher as it is for a kindergarten teacher. Um, it's different from a specialist to a classroom teacher. There, there's certainly no one size fits all answer to this question, but for a long time, schools were students centered on the backs of their faculty and their faculty's quality of life. I mean, you know, Sarah, you and I can remember days when we were at school, you know, whether it was producing the literary magazine or tournament week when we were at school till seven or eight multiple nights in a row, right? Um, oh, I've got boarding school time. I can talk to you oh, about too. Uh, Thursday night, putting the freshman to bed and writing my weekly faculty newsletter while I was uh, monitoring that they really went to bed. <laughs> right, 3 a.m. knock on the door when somebody throws up, right? Like we've all been yep. there. Um, so, but but that's just not tenable anymore. Um, and it also, it's frequently unjust and inequitable um, in how it's divided in schools and how it falls, especially sometimes on faculty of color, on young faculty, on female faculty, on unmarried faculty, you know, th these, these expectations aren't parceled out or experienced evenly. Um, and in moments like this, when the community is less well, teachers feel vulnerable in different ways, right? And mm -hmm. there were all these things that educators never, a kind of flexibility educators never imagined they would have that all of a sudden was there for a little bit. Um, that's complicated. And we don't like lose something that we, we don't like to lose something that we had for a little while if there was something good about it. And, you know, as Brad says, there are no silver linings to the pandemic, but there are lessons learned. Yeah. Um, so did you, did you learn ooh. anything that didn't feel quite so heavy? <laughs> yes. Can we, let's talk about some of those. Um, so in one session, there was a time to share things that schools are keeping. And one of the things that we love talking about were tents turning into permanent installations to increase outdoor times for everybody on campus, whether it's meals or class time, but just, hey, let's go outdoors more. Yeah, uh, loved that. It, yeah, because you know what, I mean, there's so much research that simply being outside, you don't, I mean, 
You don't even have to do anything. Simply natural light is good for us. Um, what else? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so let's talk tech for a second. You know, that's near and dear to my heart. Everybody values their tech team um, more than they ever time. did before. It's about and time. Yes, there is. And there's some nice in-depth talk about how do we help faculty and staff keep these newly acquired tech skills sharp? And I really love that. Lots of ideas there. Yeah, um, oh, that's perfect, yeah. Yeah, and then another one, one school shared that they decided that pajamas and sweatpants are now appropriate school wear, not just for students, but maybe for adults too. Um, school appropriate, but they said, hmm, this is another person started laughing at that table and said, nope, we are thrilled to be back in uniform and professional dress. And so, you know, that whole you do you and you be your school and the best version of your school that you can be, that's, that was a, a really important message. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm actually out here in a hallway in a couple of minutes, time for a question or two, but uh, it's gonna be flooded with people. I'm gonna have to put my mask back on and go down to where my Uber is. So um, let's see if there's a question here. Um, ah, question about money. So sometimes people are thinking, gosh, you know, we, um, we did the PPP part and we saved a lot of money and hopefully there's a whole bunch. And the truth is there was a lot of money spent that is not recoverable and it wasn't necessarily spent on things, that, you know, schools that bought a lot of tests, schools that had to upgrade to a different kind of filter system. Um, sometimes the, the payoff and the, um, I'm blanking on the word, but uh, <laughs> the big money that schools have that's recoup, invested. Yeah, you can't recoup yes. that. So, so, right, it just, it is what it is. They had to be spent and the expenses were high and uh, it's not money we're gonna get back. So um, that doesn't mean, I do hope that uh, PD budgets will, come forth because I will say that there is really unanimous and I see a door opening down the way. So I'm really gonna put my mask on in just a second. Um, that's, you know, this is really live folks. Um, but this idea that, you know, professional learning, when we go and we connect with each other in person, we at One Schoolhouse really believe in online learning, but it's nice to get out and to collaborate around the table as well. All right. Well, Sarah, I, I can hear the crowds approaching. Thank you for um, for reporting live from the road. This was really fun. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Uh, one last reminder that we will not be holding webinars in the month of March. We're going to be communicating out what you can expect to see in April, which we are really excited about. Um, that will be in our newsletters. We'll let you know on the listserv. Um, and um, thanks so much. Just We've been doing these for almost two years every week. It's been such a joy. Um, we're going to take a little break for a few weeks, catch our breath, and we're looking forward to being back live with you again in April. Take care, everybody. So this is probably as appropriate a sign off. It has been an honor to be with you all these times, yes. and I'm looking forward to our next round of right. webinars. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody.